In him, all families are blessed. Join our discussion on Fabric of Family. I've got a great program for us today lined up. Hope that you'll stay around to watch. Glory, hallelujah. Amen. Praise God, Jehovah. Amen. 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 Being a parent is tough business. Being a father of four, Christy and I have had our challenges with uh, trying to raise our kids the right way, uh, letting them know we care about them, and certainly helping them to have a strong faith. Uh, I've learned a lot of advice, I guess, through the years by faithful uh, parents who have shared. And I guess some of the most important advice I have received is uh, to spend time with your kids. I was recently watching with my kids a program uh, it's a reality singing uh, show called The Voice. And the premise behind the uh, show is that uh, a performer comes out and tries to capture the attention of uh, four judges, uh, four uh, instructors who will try to help them reach stardom, to have a good uh, life of success. And I thought about that, and in a lot of ways, I guess that's exactly what our kids are doing. They're involved in so much, and and really, they're doing it uh, for our attention. Uh, they're doing it to make us proud. Uh, they're doing it in a lot of ways to honor us. And I think the advice of just giving your kids time is important. Our kids are wanting us to turn our chairs around for them. You know, I think about words of encouragement from Scripture. And I guess one of the most beautiful portraits of uh, encouragement, time, uh, that I have uh, noticed is the fact that when Jesus in Matthew 3 was... Uh, baptized by John the Baptist. We have an interesting scenario unfold there. Uh, after he is immersed by John, you might remember there in John chapter 3, uh, verse 17, that the heavens opened up. There it was, very audibly, beautifully, the Father telling his Son, I'm pleased in you. I, I think those words of affirmation are are certainly uh, what our kids need when we spend time watching them, uh, encouraging them, helping them along the way. Uh, they need us there, but they also need those words of affirmation. They need to hear us say, hey, we're proud of you. And I, I hope that in some small way you uh, learn as a parent uh, that, that we're not going to be perfect. Uh, we're not always going to say the right thing and do the right thing, but we can always be there. And certainly we can be a cheerleader uh, in their corner. Well, I want to thank you for joining us for what is typically our panel discussion on Fabric of Family. I typically have a couple of guests that I interview regarding a, a family subject. Well, today I have uh, someone whom you have seen on this program uh, if you watch Fabric of Family on a regular basis, and that is Jim Merle. Uh, Jim does one of our regular segments, Family Fortunes of Faith. Uh, Jim, it's good to finally have you uh, here in, in this medium. Uh, to be able to talk about something that's very close to your heart and to your family's heart and uh, to those who love and appreciate you. And we're going to get in that in just a moment, but uh, I do want to mention that you are one of the evangelists at the Ironiton right. Church of Christ in Talladega, Alabama. Uh, you work uh, along with uh, another fine gospel preacher, Cliff Goodwin, uh, who is involved in uh, television uh, programming as well. And you uh, are the editor of a website, and I want to give you the opportunity to mention that at this time, so that people can find that. Yes, sir. I've been I've been managing and, and basically producing the website of TruthBeToldOrg mm -hmm. for probably eight or nine years now. It's something I really enjoy. Um, I try to have a lot of content on there as far as things that are updated, sermons and such as that. Uh, the main thing I'm focused on as of late is basically doing a little program. It's kind of a YouTube program, Your Daily Dose. And the intention of that, as we're going to get into later, is just to try to support and uphold people during difficult times. It's easy to have faith in God when things are going well, and not so easy when things are hard. And so that program tries to entertain that idea. And of course, the website is a way of driving that. And Jim, you're certainly very qualified to talk about things like that because of your own life experience. 
and uh, that's why we wanted you to be on the program today to, to, to share with us some, some things that have been uh, going on in your life for some time. Uh, you have, uh, have had a battle with your health in years past. Uh, first of all, let me just ask you this question. How old are you, Jim? I'm 39 years old. 39 years old. And uh, for those who are watching the program, you may be uh, surprised to know that uh, this 39-year-old uh, uh, man uh, sitting here beside me has uh, struggled with uh, heart issues all of his life. Jim, what uh, condition were you originally diagnosed with? I was born with what's known as transposition of the great vessels. Now that was found uh, within a day or so of my birth. That was in 1975, so technologies are not exactly what they are now. Mm -hmm. But it was found fairly quickly. I was blessed in that. And basically that condition implies that my heart operated backwards. It wasn't physically backwards, but just the way that it was hooked up plumbing-wise. It had uh, my larger pump, which is supposed to take blood to the body and supply energy and such as that through the blood. It had my larger pump going to the lungs versus my smaller pump uh, trying to power my body. And so because of that, that was something I could not live with in the beginning. And I had to have a corrective surgery to try to repair that. Now, what kind of symptoms would that cause? In um, I, was known, I was known as a child as what's called a blue baby. And basically for a parent, that must have been a terror. Um, even from birth and on throughout the months as I waited to have a surgery where I could have one, uh, I would completely need resuscitating. I would turn blue, stop breathing, and such as that, and I would have to be constantly resuscitated through CPR, through breaths and such. And so that made it difficult on my parents. Uh, of course, there's a lot of stress there. Your child mm -hmm. could pass at any time. And uh, even my grandparents at that time, uh, they loved me, uh, but most people wouldn't spend a lot of time holding me, even as a child, because they didn't want to be that person who had me in their arms if that were to have happened, if I would have passed away. So. so were you diagnosed with this condition at birth or was this something shortly after? Within a few days, they had pretty much figured out what was going on. It was a matter at that point in time of there wasn't really a good surgery to correct that. It's a pretty rare condition. I had two holes in my heart that kind of compounded those problems. And so they kind of had to decide what to do. And they had first told my parents that there was no way to open me up. In 1975, that was unheard of to have an open heart surgery on such a young child. And so they wouldn't open me up. They wanted to wait a year. Uh, I was born roughly eight pounds. At uh, six months old, I weighed nine. Mm -hmm. And so I just wasn't able to grow, wasn't able to function. And so they were forced into doing a surgery for six months, which, by the way, at that time, 1975, uh, made me the youngest baby ever to be opened up to have an open heart surgery. So I, I think that's a significant fact for those who are watching the program today that uh, you were the, the youngest child in the state of Alabama right. to ever undergo open heart surgery. And right. uh, again, you were how old? I was six months old six at that months time. Old I had just, uh, it was actually, it was just a few days ago. September the 29th was my 39 year anniversary for that. So. Well, as you think about uh, growing up and, uh, and all, how did this condition affect you physically? And also, I'm curious, uh, as far as mentally, as a child, um, were you held back from doing certain things? Did you, were you fully aware of what was going on? A lot of questions there, but basically, as a younger child especially, I had no idea. I did so well after surgery and they never predicted. There was only a 10% chance given to my parents that I would even come out of the surgery. Of course, there was no life expectancy without it, so they made that choice and I'm blessed by that. Uh, but uh, as I came out of surgery and as I began to grow, I can't remember as a small child being very aware of it other than uh, knowing that I had very regular doctor appointments. I would go to these doctor visits. I knew something was special because when I would go to the cardiologist, of course, I didn't understand that's who it was, mm -hmm. but when I would go to the cardiologist, there wouldn't be one or two doctors in the room. I can remember at times they would move everything out of the exam room into conference rooms or different places because there would sometimes be 20 and 30 doctors uh, stacked around the room all trying to see what was going on, trying to understand. So I remember that. Uh, I remember as a child having some restrictions as far as the doctor said, you can't run, you can't do this, you can't do that. But at the same time, my parents were uh, very loving and caring and flexible. Uh, they pretty much let me do what I could. And I snuck around to do some of that. But I mean, I ran and played. I had a great, a great childhood, just as any other child. Uh, mm. You know, hung out in the neighborhood, played football, basketball, baseball, whatever's in season. And so I really enjoyed that part. But there were some restrictions. I knew that if I pushed myself too hard, 
uh, even then that my lips would turn blue. Um, I would have difficulty sometimes breathing, uh, get very fatigued easily. I didn't have the energy that every child did, but I had plenty. I had a good time, and so I was able to enjoy right. my childhood. So this surgery that you had as a child, uh, this was something that was only for the purposes of getting you so far uh, down the line in time. It wasn't a permanent fix. It wasn't supposed to be. It was considered at that point to be kind of a treatment, not a cure, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was something they really didn't expect me to live out of childhood. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, one thing that, that happened a, little, a lot later in life, when I was 18, and the doctor had no way of knowing this, I had never met my transplant surgeon. As a matter of fact, in that day, he did the surgery. He saw my parents the next day. They had not seen him since. That's the way things are and were. And uh, he happened, just by providence, I guess, he called my mother's house, dug in some old records they hadn't moved, called my mother's house on what happened to my 18th birthday and just simply asked her uncomfortably, is he still alive? He didn't expect that. They didn't think I would make it out of childhood even with the surgery. Of course, she was able to happily tell him, yes, he's doing well, he's working, he's this, he's that. And so that was a great moment for her and for me. Yeah. I had made it that long and at that point in time had had absolutely no problems. I'd never taken a pill. I had some small restrictions that I pretty much ignored by that point and just functioned like anybody else. All right, so let me get some clarification. When you had this surgery as a, as a baby, uh, was this simply a procedure to fix your existing heart or did you actually have a transplant as a baby? It was to repair my existing heart. They did something then a relatively new known as the mustard procedure. Now that doesn't mean anything to us, but it was a certain way that they repaired a transposed heart. Again, it was rare, yeah. uh, but that was the procedure they had used on children much older or adults, and it's something they had to try on me at that point in time. Since that time, there's been another surgery developed known as the arterial switch. Mm -hmm. It's a much uh, better solution. Um, had I been able to have that, I would have had much more of a guarantee of, yeah. of survival than I ever did. Uh, but as it turned out, uh, I wasn't able to have a second surgery. I never needed one, that's mm -hmm. a blessing. But at that point in time, that wasn't an option. Once the mustard procedure was done, the way it had to be done, there was no going back. And so I was pretty much to live with the heart I had best I could. Well, Jim, you mentioned um, how that if you had had this other procedure, uh, perhaps you would have had more of a guarantee. And, and of course that implies that you're mindful of the fact that y you could have uh, passed at any time. Uh, right. He, 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 at what point in your life, I mean, was it a, a small child, was it a, you know, a teenager, did you uh, come to understand the seriousness of your situation and how that life was just hanging in the balance? As I said earlier, as a child I was aware that something had happened. I was aware when I was five or six years old, you go to school, now you have some restrictions. Mm -hmm. But it really was probably more in my teenage years, I'm talking 15, 16, 17, that I realized what had really happened and the fact that I, even though I felt well, mm. I was never going to be, as we would say, out of the woods. There was always the potential that things were going to go bad. The doctors did an outstanding job of watching me, monitoring me through the years, and constantly uh, teaching, updating me what to look for, what signs. As a matter of fact, uh, I've said before, they kind of, they named out, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, this is how it's going to go. And they even had warned my family, my wife by that point, uh, that, you know, before he's 40, he's going to have some very hard problems to deal with. There's going to be something that's going to happen. Whether it be a heart attack, that would be a, a really, in that case, a good, a good thing. Uh, not that it would improve me, but that was the best case scenario, to have a heart attack. The other side of that was I could just pass. Well, uh, you know, I think about a young person being in that situation, a teenager, and uh, did that have any bearing on your teen years? I mean, the knowledge that you were in a, a position in which your life was in jeopardy and you know the, the wrong activity or, or, or perhaps just by uh, chance of uh, the circumstances your uh, your life could end like that uh, did, did that not mentally uh, uh, have an impact upon you or was it something that you just kind of accepted because you grew up with it or I think it, honestly it was something I always accepted um, there were some disappointments in life. This is just an example that leads to something, but I wasn't able to play uh, organized sports, especially football. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to play that. The impact, obviously, right. uh, the, the running, the exercise, the endurance that was needed, I wasn't supposed to play. 
So I became a manager slash eventually a trainer with the football team there in my hometown. And uh, by that point in time, I had completely let go, I think, of any, in my mind, any real worries. And uh, I pretty much uh, went through the motions that everybody else did. Mm -hmm. When they ran wind sprints at the end of practice, which at, at, back in our day there were plenty of those, um, I ran with the team. As a matter of fact, at that point in time, the coaches would comment, I was probably the fastest person, one of the fastest people on the team. I could outrun the running backs. <laughs> but that's because there wasn't really any fear. I just didn't seem or didn't feel like I had anything to fear. I knew that, I thought to myself at least, the better shape I can stay in, the better my chances are. And so I, you know, I worked out in the weight rooms, never really looked like it, but uh, spent a lot of time running and doing things not to intentionally take care of myself, but inadvertently, right. I tried to stay active. And that really helped me. I mean, it really helped mm -hmm. me survive for a number of years, I know. So what about your, your social life as a teenager? Did uh, your condition um, have any effect upon that uh, in any degree? For me, it wasn't really any different because uh, being from a small town, 1,800 total population, yeah. And being that many of those people were cousins or whatever, you know how it goes, uh, those people all knew my background. They all appreciated and knew what I was capable of doing. And uh, sometimes, you know, I would, I would actually, even then, I didn't realize it when I was going through it. But I, I feel like at times I had a lot of people who came to me who had other issues, other problems, whether it be physical or whatever. And they would come to me kind of as a source, you know, to say even then, as a teenager, you deal with this and here's how you deal with it and I have my problem too. Mm -hmm. And so I think I was able to inadvertently reach out there and that constantly helped me to, to keep a better attitude at least. Mm -hmm. And no one ever really that I can remember looked at me and thought I was broken. Yeah. And that was a big help and that's one thing I've learned that uh, when someone is, is having health issues or especially health issues, when you treat them as if they're broken, that's exactly what they're going to be. Well, tell me about the day you met a young lady by the name of Jennifer and uh, how this uh, encounter greatly impacted your life. It really did. At that point in time, uh, just to reveal too much, probably um, I, I had a lot of confidence in myself, uh, pretty high strung, honestly high tempered, uh, that type of thing, you know, uh, wasn't afraid of anything. Uh, I kind of looked at myself, hey, if, I be if I'm beating this, no one else can hurt me. And uh, so I kind of carry myself in that way, in a sense. Uh, not really mm. that troublesome, I don't think. But yeah. meeting up with her, we met at the Youth Devo at the church, at my home congregation. Uh, she would say it was love at first sight. I would probably say that. I promised her within the week I was going <coughs> to marry her. And so mm. I guess that would have been the case. And uh, we talked a lot then. I had set my standards pretty high by that point. I wasn't on the big active dating scene. Uh, not because I didn't necessarily want to be, I just, I had standards. I tried to have standards. And she met those immediately. And so that was good. Um, as she would tell it though as later, I didn't reveal any of this. Mm -hmm. and she didn't know about any problems. I looked as active and healthy, I think, as anyone. So she didn't know about this. She didn't know what she was getting into. She didn't know about your, your, your past medical history. None at all, none uh, at all. Until later on in the relationship. Yes, it was, it was much later. I can't remember exactly how that came about, but she, that came up and she found out. But and, and what was her response? Her response was basically, uh, you know, why did you let me fall in love with you and, and yeah. you could die? Because yeah. again, the outlook, uh, although uh, the evidence by that point, time-wise, health-wise was showing that things were great. They even reminded me much later that the condition I had and the way it was repaired, it would allow me to have a, a, function, a full functioning life and no symptoms. Most heart failure patients, uh, they notice things like uh, shortness of breath. Being transposed, that was never an issue for me. My heart was backwards. My problem was fatigue. Most uh, heart failure patients, swelling, mm -hmm. fluid retention, not me my fluid and my legs, my ankles, none of that was ever the case. And that was great in a way. And I continue to function even more than ever at times. But they always said, you know, that's bad because you guys, as they refer to me, you tend to take the, the turns for the worst. You're the guy that you're fine one day and the next day it's over. Yeah. And so I knew that, I understood yeah. that, kind of accepted it. She had to learn to accept it. Mm. And just to kind of go forward in time just a bit, I, the 
uh, relationship with Jennifer uh, grew uh, stronger and stronger and right. that brought you to the point of where uh, you two decided that you wanted to be married. Right. We married in 97. We had been dating about three yeah. years, been engaged for a year of that. At that time, I worked at a, a job. I loved building cabinets. I've been building cabinets since I was 14 years old. I love working with my hands. I was in supervision at a cabinet plant. Uh, made really good money. Uh, but I worked a lot of hours. 60, 70 hours was not far-fetched. Um, I was kind of the Forrest Gump of the place. Um, I, I ran everywhere I went just to do it. Um, I was still able to do that and uh, functioned at a very high level at that point. And so, you know, because of that, we had kind of gotten to a point that things were just normal. This is just the way things are. He's fine. And so, you know, as, as we go through, it's always in the back of your mind, especially for her, that this is potential, but it didn't seem real. And li life really progressed well. on, you were working, uh, you had children? Yes, I, my daughter Juliana, uh, at the time that I fell ill, was roughly four. And so uh, my son, uh, by that point in time, he was very young. Mm -hmm. By the time anything really came up, uh, but uh, nonetheless, what I've always said about that, my daughter knew me when I was still running, playing, rolling yeah. around in the floor. My son, by that point, never got to know that. Yeah. By the time he was old enough to know what was going on, I was sick. Yeah. 16, 18 hours a day sleeping was, was typical. No energy was, was this life. Um, so at this point, are you, can, I mean, are you able to work at all? You said you had to sleep a lot, rest yes, a lot. Yes, I had to. Uh, I had several years before, around 2000 to 2001, mm -hmm. had uh, began to, to preach. And I'd been preaching on a very regular basis for about three years. And oh, I mean by that, filling pulpits week mm -hmm. in and week out. Chosen to go to Memphis School of Preaching, did that, now come back and was preaching full time in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Well, what, what brought you down that path? I mean, what, what was it that made you decide, you know, this is, this is what I want to do? I want to preach. I want to be a preacher of the gospel. It was, it was later for me. Uh, my brother's a preacher. My dad is an elder and, and, and such. And uh, Preachers go back in our family for about five generations, mm -hmm. elders the same. And so it was almost a logical, typical, mm -hmm. typical thing to do, but it was never something that I was asked to do mm -hmm. or, or you know, expected to do or anything like that. It's something I just kind of began to do. I had uh, been teaching a teenage Bible class. I had tried my hand at song leading, leading prayers, and eventually I finally said one day, you know what, I've done everything but preach. Yeah. I'm going to do that today. And I did that. I felt pretty good about it and moved from there. So. And so you're preaching, uh, I assume, in Mississippi right. uh, for a period of time. But there was a day uh, that I know is uh, pretty significant to you uh, because of some uh, things that occurred on this occasion. It was September the 30th, 2006. Right. Tell us about that day. That day was an eye-opening day. Again, for that period of time, 30 some odd years, 30 plus years, no problems, no pills, you know, things were what they were. Just going harder than anybody. Even as, as a preacher, I've always said, I continue to stand by this, if I would put 70 hours to building cabinets, I would put 70 hours into preaching. God doesn't deserve any less. And so that's how I was functioning in Philadelphia, wide open all the time. Uh, we were at the house that evening. We were going to have some of the elders over for a cookout and was standing there at the kitchen sink, you know, eyeing my grill, making sure it was ready, uh, doing something, maybe washing my hands. And Jennifer saw me reach up and, and begin to feel my pulse. And I think the look on my face versus what I was doing, she stopped and questioned me. She said, what's wrong? And I said, my heart's stopping which that's not something that happens. Wow. It's not something that should happen. And it would. It would stop for, I guess, four or five seconds. Nothing. I was functioning, talking, whatever, but it would stop. Of course, you kind of don't want to believe that. So, and I mean, what, what is that kind of sensation did that give you? Very, very strange, <laughs> I got to say. It was, it was weird. I don't yeah. know what else to call it. Um, but we, you, you knew something was, was, was amiss there. Right. You knew it was your heart. And, and at that point, I, yes, absolutely. I knew it was my heart. At that time, you don't, I had no idea what that would be, mm. but I've never been one to be sick, to go to the doctor unless I had to. This was a moment where there wasn't any argument. You need to go to the emergency room 
let's go. I was fine with that. We so go to the, so you didn't pass out or nothing. have a cardiac arrest no. at this point. No. Okay, uh, it was it was relaxed enough. We called and canceled our guests that were on the way. Told them where we were going. Yeah. Went to the local emergency room there, which was very small, yeah. Yeah. and uh, went there. Uh, called Birmingham, which is I had always done calling UAB, wanting advice. They asked that a 12 lead EKG be done. The hospital there at that time only had a four lead. Uh, they couldn't do any better. They put that on me. The doctor who was sitting, literally sitting on the other side of the glass, uh, was so terrified, and she admitted it, not just the look, she admitted she was so terrified, she did not want me there. She wanted me in an ambulance on a helicopter headed mm -hmm. to UAB. They didn't want to handle my case. Uh, they delayed a while because UAB was trying to decide what to do, and eventually I was taken to UAB. And uh, at that point in time, I'm still thinking, okay, so I've had something they were calling a PVC which is, it is what it is. My heart would beat regularly, mm -hmm. stop for any length of time, and then start back. One of my elders immediately came to the hospital and he stayed back with me maybe five minutes. And he kept looking at the monitor with this terrible look on his face and he finally said, I can't watch this. He couldn't watch me mm -hmm. flatline and, and talk to him. It was just so oh. strange. He, he left the room, he went back out. And uh, I felt that way too, but I wasn't, I don't think I was really afraid. I just, I wanted to know what was happening. Yeah. Of course, we go to UAB and uh, I, I thought I was, I thought I was a champ. This is going to be more of a joke. Yeah. yeah. And things are going to be all right. I'm coming back home in a little while. And of course, that wasn't so what exactly happened? the way it worked. So what happened? What, what did they find out? What did they... Uh, what did they tell you you needed to be doing or not doing? Or? We go to UAB, they confirmed that yes, you're having these PVCs. And they confirmed that that was my first of these things they had named years before. Here it is, these are your rhythm problems, which I knew that, I remembered that. Here's your rhythm problems and here's what's going to happen. And again, they were very good at knowing what was going to happen. Even though my case was mm -hmm. so different, uh, they would do tests and because my heart was, was so, the anatomy was so different, they would come up with numbers that wouldn't look that bad on paper, but at the same time, they had no baseline. They didn't know exactly where I stood. And uh, well, they questioned me at UAB. Uh, we should not have done it probably, but we drove, or my wife drove me from three and a half hours mm -hmm. from Mississippi to UAB that night. I didn't choose the ambulance because I wanted the children to be able to go. And uh, they asked me, I walked to the floor, mm -hmm. admitted myself basically. And they asked me, after they had done some tests, uh, they said, how in the world did you get in here? Well, I walked. We don't, we don't believe that. We don't know how that's possible. Mm -hmm. But that again, that was my symptoms. That's what I was able to do. Well, that's all the time that we have today. Next week, as you know, we're going to continue our discussion with Jim.